In a previous video, I covered the ancestors of mammals. It ended with the first mammals emerging in the Upper Triassic. But how did it go on, what is it about the claim that mammals hardly evolved during the Mesozoic and remained at the level of mouse-like creatures? I would argue that this view is wrong and out of date, because during the Mesozoic important course was set, which only made the emergence of mammals possible in the tertiary. As we have seen, some of the cynodonts also survived for a relatively long time and coexisted with the mammals. To draw the line between the two groups is arbitrary and there is no unanimous opinion. Because many of the features that we claim for mammals can hardly be proven in fossil form. What all mammals have in common is that they produce a type of milk, they are all endothermic and have fur. Another characteristic that emerged in course of evolution are the three ossicles. Today there are three different groups of mammals. The monotremes are the oldest group in evolutionary terms and still lay eggs. Marsupials and placentas, on the other hand, are viviparous, but most marsupials lack a placenta so that a large part of the embryonic development takes place in the pouch. But when did these groups separate from each other? We find a clue in the genes and proteins of today's animals. So-called genetic clocks assume that there is a certain amount of deviations per generation. Due to the differences between different species, the degree of kinship can be determined on the one hand, but also how many generations lie between the common ancestor. The uncertainty of dating is mainly due to how long a generation can be estimated and how many genetic changes take place per generation. This leads to large areas of uncertainty, which in the case of the mammal groups also overlap massively. In order to further narrow down the areas, fossil representatives of the groups can be consulted. In this way, the areas for the separation between placenta and marsupials, but also, above all, the separation from the monotremes can be massively limited. By including extinct groups that are believed to be closer to placenta and marsupials, the period can be narrowed down further and thus falls into the upper Triassic. The ancestor of all mammals living today lived sometime between 220 and 210 million years ago. The first tangible fossils of mammals belonging to the Allotheria group appear 205 million years ago. Their distribution corresponds to that of the mammalia forms, while the older groups of the cynodonts were concentrated in the south. Both fossils and the distribution of the first mammals suggest that the group originated in North America. The origin of the mammals in the narrower sense is therefore the crown group between the monotremes and the other mammals. The monotremes now have some strange properties that at first do not appear to be typical of mammals. First, they lay eggs using the cloaca, a single hole. Secondly, this includes both the intestinal anus and the exits from the urinary tract and genital organs. Third, the platypus is the only mammal that produces poison today. Platypus and echidna belong to the supergroup of Australis fenida, which are characterized by a special tooth structure. Basically, teeth and jaw fragments are also the only things that have remained from the early mammals. Finally, some biologists have combined the Australis fenida with the Shuotheriidae to form the Eunotheria supergroup, which now faces the other mammals, the Theriforms. Fruita facer is variously regarded on the one hand as the Theriforms, but on the other hand often as an outer group of both the Theriforms and the Eunotheria. Difficulties in exact assignment are not uncommon in early mammals, and so the same animals are found in different groups from different sources. The original form of the mammals is likely to have led a scansorial way of life and fed on insects. This way of life was also adopted by most of the early Eunotherias. The Shuotheria were small animals and lived in the Upper Jurassic in Asia. The Australis fenida, however, are found exclusively in the southern continents. Their ancestors left North America either to the east or to the south. Of the Australis fenida only the Monotremida and the Austrictus fenidae survived the Jurassic. Since both groups lived mainly in Australia, it stands to reason that they originated there too. The only exception is the platypus, Monotremidum lived in Argentina, although it may also be that this came here via the Antarctic, so to speak in the opposite direction that we will see with the marsupials. The Eunotheria had their peak in the Lower Cretaceous period. In contrast to the following groups, representatives have survived to this day. 
however, their habitat is limited to Australia and New Guinea. The next group of mammals consists of the Multichiberculata, Gondwanatheria, and Harami Uda. They are grouped together to form the Allotheria supergroup, which means nothing but strange animals. Due to the structure of the teeth, it is believed that the Multichiberculata occupied the same ecological niche that the rodents claimed later. In contrast to these, however, they laid eggs. The position of the Gondwanatheria is uncertain, some see them as a subgroup of the Multichiberculata, others as an independent branch. As the name suggests, this group of animals originated in the large southern continent of Gondwana. Particularly old traces of the Harami Uda can be found. The Upper Jurassic representatives resemble modern squirrels and are likely to have had a corresponding way of life. The oldest traces of the Harami Uda can be found in Europe and Greenland, later the group spreads to East Asia and North America. The North American Honodonts switched to an arboreal and herbivorous way of life. The oldest traces of the Multichiberculata can also be found in the Upper Triassic, also in Europe and North America. They too had adopted an arboreal and herbivorous way of life. Groups later also migrate to East Asia. The early groups such as the Palcophacioidea and the Plagiolacoidea had their heyday in the Jurassic and the Lower Cretaceous. But they disappeared about 100 million years ago. The Gondwanatheria are represented here as a subgroup of the Multichiberculata, but there is also the possibility that they form a sister group. In contrast to the Multichiberculata, it is omnivorous, and its range is limited to the southern continents. The group of Sudamaricidae even reached the Antarctic, probably as a companion to the migratory marsupials in the early tertiary. In South America, representatives of this group survived until about 17 million years ago. After the early Multichiberculata became extinct, their descendants, the Similodonts, took their place. They lived mainly in Europe and North America, with Cory Batar, a representative of the group in Australia, who lived in the Lower Cretaceous. Many survived the great mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period. The Similodontidae survived until the end of the Paleocene, the Tilodonts even until the end of the Eocene 33 million years ago. Other groups of the Simoldonts followed, most of them stayed in North America and Europe, but the jumping mouse like Jadokatatheria went to Central Asia. Hence the tradition that the names of many Multichiberculata end with the Mongolian term Batar, which means hero. The Teniolabids and the Kagayanids are the youngest groups of the Multichiberculata. They spread to North America and East Asia. The last of them died out in the early Eocene. The Allotheria have seen a series of ups and downs. The first high point was the Upper Jura. While the Harami Uda died out in the Lower Cretaceous, the position of the Multichiberculata strengthened in the Upper Cretaceous. They too had to give up during the mass extinction, but they started off quite successfully in the tertiary. But with the onset of the Eocene, the rapid decline begins. The extent to which this has to do with the spread of placental rodents, which dispute their ecological niche, has not yet been fully clarified. In any case, in isolated South America, the Gondwanatheria survived the Multichiberculata by 16 million years. The Allotheria are therefore completely extinct, a fate that the next groups also share. The sister group of the Allotheria are the Holotheria, which means whole animals. In some cladograms the group of Kihneotheriidae appears as a subgroup, these lived 220 to 195 million years ago and are now more likely to be counted among the mammalia forms within the cynodonts. On the other hand, there is little doubt that the two groups of Utriconodonta and Tenodonta belong to the Holotheria. As the name suggests, the former is characterized by teeth that have three conical elevations. The name Tenodontidae means expanding tooth. The Triconodonts have been found on all continents with exception of Australia. Soon they switched to a ground-dwelling way of life, and in the lower Jurassic the groups of Amphidonts and Gobiconodonts supplemented their diet with meat. Repenomimus was one meter long, the giant among the Mesozoic mammals. In the world of dinosaurs they were admittedly only dwarfs. The Jaholodentidae are named after their famous location in China. They seem to have been insectivores. 
the Valaticotherini adopted a different way of life, they developed sliding skins between their extremities and were thus able to float back and forth between trees. They thus resemble modern gliding squirrels and gliding marsupials and appeared at the same time as the first birds. The Valaticotherini already disappeared in the lowest Cretaceous, and no other Triconodont survived the Mesozoic era. The Tenodonts also died out in the lower Cretaceous. The Triconodonts reached their peak in the lower Cretaceous, at the time when the Tenodonts disappeared. But then the rapid decline began, and the last of them fell victim to the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. The sister group of the Eutrichinodonts and Tenodonts were the Trichnotheria, which means something like fast animals. The Trichnotheria in turn split into the two groups Symmetrodonta and Cladotheria. The Symmetrodonts got their name because of the symmetrical structure of their teeth. While the basal Trichnotherine were mainly limited to the western Laurasia, the Symmetrodonta also spread to the eastern areas of the northern continent. They are only detectable in fossil form from the beginning of the Cretaceous period. Some basic representatives even survive the mass extinction, but already disappear in the Paleocene. Like the Eutrichinodonts, many of them lived on the ground, but they remained insectivores throughout. Like the Eutrichinans, they peaked in the lower Cretaceous relatively soon after their emergence, then began their gradual descent. The Cladotheria in turn split into the Dryolestida and the Zetheria. As with the previous groups, they are also primarily documented by their teeth. The Dryolestidae were the first group and arose as early as the Middle Jurassic. This group, which colonized both Laurasia and South America, lasted until the Great Mass Extinction. The Porodonts had a significantly shorter life on the border between the Jura and the Cretaceous. According to the producers, the animation character Scrat from the Ice Age films represents an early mammal from the Mesozoic era. Of course, its appearance in the Ice Age is an anachronism. While most of his role models were insectivore, Scrat is famous for his fixation on acorns. However, oaks only appeared in the Upper Cretaceous. The Meridiolestides within the Dryolestida originated in South America and were mainly found in Argentina. One of the larger creatures was Polygrotherium that was about 80 cm long. The name means dangerous animal for whatever reason. The Mesungulates results survived the Great Mass Extinction, but already disappeared in the Middle Paleocene. However, a Meridiolestide survived the Paleogene. Necrolests, a rather strange animal appeared in the Miocene after a long hiatus. But 17 million years ago the Dryolestida came to an end. There are some gaps in the tradition of the Dryolestids. After their formation they have a climax at the border between the Jura and the Cretaceous, then their traces disappear until they reach their maximum in the Upper Cretaceous. The group was severely affected by the mass extinction, and its tertiary presence was marginal at best. The sister group of the Dryolestids, the Zetheria, produced two other groups during the late Jurassic, the Amphitheriida and the Paramura. Both groups are named after an eponymous animal, either Amphitherium or Paramus. How in the case of previous mammals it is mainly teeth and jaw fragments that can be used for the determination. All who did not belong to these groups are summarized in the Tribosphenides. As you can guess from the name, it is an indication of the tooth structure. The Tribosphenida in turn split up into the Aegilodontia and the Theria. The Theria are the crown group of all placenta and marsupials living today. One of the most famous basal Zetherium is Vince Lests from Argentina. Other basic representatives also lived in China and Mongolia. The Amphitheriida and Paramura lived in Eura USIA and Africa. Neither group was granted long presence, and the basal Zetheria also died out 100 million years ago. The Tribosphenides remained. Their basic representatives appeared at the beginning of the Cretaceous period and disappeared 70 million years ago. Their distribution area was North and South America. The Aegilodontia, a group of the Tribosphenides, persisted in what is now Mongolia until only 100 million years ago. Amphitheria only occurred briefly during the Upper Jurassic, the other two groups arose in the Cretaceous, but they did not see its end. When did mammals begin giving birth alive is a difficult question. It can be assumed, however,
that a form of live birth was adopted over 160 million years ago. In contrast to monotones, the intestines and urinary tract are separated in both placental animals and marsupials, and the genital organs are integrated into the urinary tract. In marsupials, the embryo only develops in the womb until it has used up all the nutrients. Then the unfinished fetus migrates into the pouch, where it finds several different teats that provide nutrients for different ages. The actual suckling of the fully developed young animals also takes place in the bag. The placenta animals have fully integrated embryonic development into the urogenital area through the formation of a placenta that nourishes the fetus. The oldest known marsupial is Cynodelphys, it appeared in China 130 million years ago. Basal representatives of the so-called metatheria can also be found in North America, Egypt, and even Australia. However, this Australian representative also only came to the later continent of the marsupials via the Antarctic Land Bridge. The main distribution area of the early groups of marsupials is Laurasia, only the basal marsupialiformes reach the continent which later becomes the center of the marsupial world, namely South America. Both they and the Deltatheridiidae survived into the Paleocene. The Asiadelphia, however, disappear before the end of the Cretaceous period. While Deltatheroida, Asiadelphia, and the basal marsupialiformes shortly before or after the Great Mass Extinction, the basal metatheria experienced a renewed heyday during the tertiary. However, they died out 33 million years ago in another mass extinction. The Archimetatheria were all carnivores or durophages and lived on both American continents. The subgroup of the Stegodontidae also produced forms that liked to stay in the water. Another group, the Alphadontidae, lived in both North America and East Asia. The Herpetotheria that occurred in all continents except Australia were cosmopolitan. The group emerged at the end of the Cretaceous period and survived until 13 million years ago. One representative even made it to the isolated Indian subcontinent. The last marsupials in Africa and Europe belonged to this group. Marsupials disappeared 23 million years ago in Africa and 10 million years later in Europe. While the Alphadonts and Archimetatheria had their peak in the Cretaceous period, this is found with the Herpetotheria in the Eocene and Oligocene. The gradual decline of this group began in the Miocene. The Anatolia Delphia were a small group of marsupials that lived in what is now Turkey. The Peredectidae, on the other hand, lived mainly in North and South America, although a later representative can also be found in Thailand. The last marsupial of Asia and Eurasia survived there until about 11 million years ago. The group also includes the last marsupials in North America, which died out 28 million years ago. It was only with the reunification of the continents that South American marsupials were finally able to gain a foothold again in the northern continent. A large group of marsupials mainly native to South America were the Polydolopimorphia. Only a very early Cretaceous representative still lived in North America. The largely isolated South America now became a hot spot for marsupial development. At the beginning of the tertiary, the passage through Antarctica was also open a route that various groups of marsupials used to travel to Australia. The Polydolopimorphia are divided into two large subgroups, both of which are found in South America and the Antarctic. The Bonapartheriiformes are named after the naturalist Charles Lucien Bonaparte, whose uncle was none other than Napoleon. The Cholpaceini, whose representatives have been found in both South America and Australia, are interesting. This means that the migration across the Antarctic can be narrowed down to around 55 million years. The longest lived group were the Argyrolagidae, which probably only became extinct at the beginning of the Holocene. Probably the best known subgroup of the marsupials are the Sparasodans. In tertiary South America they took on the role that the carnivores took on in the other continents. In the spirit of convergent evolution, the group even produced the marsupial version of the saber-toothed cats, the thylacosmolids. They were extremely successful, but fell victim to the superior big cats that they ousted in the course of the Great American Exchange. The crown group of today's marsupials was probably formed about 80 million years ago. They originated in South America and later migrated over the Antarctic land bridge to Australia. 
the Microbiothriidae live from the so-called Australia Delphia in South America and the Antarctic Seymour Island. They are living fossils from the Great Migration to Australia. New finds also show that Australia was also colonized by placenta animals. However, these seem to have been at a disadvantage compared to the marsupials. The possibility of early termination, which exists in marsupials, is believed to be a survival benefit in Australia's harsh environment. The Polydolopimorphia experienced their peak in the Eocene, the Sparacidonta in the Miocene. It would be interesting to speculate what would have happened without the exchange with North American wildlife. Today the marsupials live a niche existence in South and North America, but without the exchange, predatory marsupials would still dominate South America today. Okay, finally our group, the placenta animals. Their roots can be traced back to the presumed origin 160 million years ago. The oldest representative is Jeremiah, who lived in China. Since the first marsupials were discovered in China, it can be assumed that the theria originated in East Asia. Eamea, which lived 30 million years later, was also found in China. Both animals stand for the early formation of the placenta, which allowed these animals to breed safely. However, it was still a long way to the last common ancestor of all placenta animals living today. Many groups pioneered the future rulers of the Earth, including the Zalamdalistids and the Gelestids. The latter also produced quite large specimens, which again refutes the claim that only mouse-sized mammals lived during the Mesozoic era. The Zalamdalistids even managed to survive just into the Paleocene, the primitive Didymochonidae even survived until the middle of the Miocene. Their distribution was largely limited to the northern continents, with exception of the Gelestids, of which a representative even made it to India. Another extinct group are the Leptocyta. The best known representative is Leptocidium, which belonged to the famous fauna of the Messel Pit in Germany. They were strange little beings that resembled tiny kangaroos in shape. The group died out at the end of the Oligocene. Another extinct sister group are the Adapis auriculidae, which appear at the end of the Cretaceous and disappeared again in the Lower Eocene. Because of their resemblance to modern mammals, they were at times even considered early relatives of today's hedgehogs. It can be clearly seen that the early placenta animals flourished during the Upper Cretaceous. Even if they were badly affected by the Great Mass Extinction, many of these groups were able to develop well in the emerging tertiary. In the end, however, they disappear in the Miocene at the latest, probably superseded by their dominant relatives. Finally, the Simolsta are the last large group of mammals that do not belong to the crown group of the Placentalia. They arise in the Upper Cretaceous, but are particularly common in the Paleogene. They probably originated in Laurasia and are therefore mainly found in North America and Europe and East Asia. The still Audants seem to have specialized in digging up and consuming roots, as one suspects based on their teeth. A large group within the Simolsta are the Pantodonta. Here we find impressive animals such as the Coryphodon and Tetanoids during the Eocene. Basal representatives even made the leap to South America, but there they died out again in the Paleocene. The group was species-rich and should have played a not insignificant role during the Paleogene. However, like other early mammals, they were ousted by their more successful relatives before the end of the Eocene. Another successful group of the Simolsta were the Tilodonts, which also produced impressive creatures such as Trigosis. They and the group of the Paleorictidae died out before the end of the Eocene. The last group of the Simolsta were now the Pantalsta, whose last representatives survived until the end of the Oligocene. Some basal representatives even adopted an aquatic way of life and probably resembled modern otters. The Simolsta were probably the most successful of the now extinct groups of mammals in the Paleogene. They were obviously profiteers from the great mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period and quickly gained ground. But it seems that another mass extinction at the end of the Eocene put an end to these so successful animals. What was left was a humble aftertaste. That leaves our own group called Placentalia. Based on molecular clocks, it is assumed that the last common ancestor probably lived 95 million years ago. Then the split into Atlantogenata and Boreoeutheria took place. 
The Atlantogenata for their part are the ancestors of the Aphrotheria and Xenarthra, the Boreo Eutheria produced the Lorazotheria and the Yu Archontogliers, which ultimately also include humans. Although molecular clocks point to the Upper Cretaceous, the groups remain elusive in fossil form. At the end of the Cretaceous period, Protungulatum, an early representative of the ungulates can be found. Purgatorius, an early primate, is also one of the oldest known placentalia. The oldest tangible traces of Aphrotheria are 63 million years old, the oldest fossils of Xenarthra are 48 million years old. There are also many interesting extinct groups within the Placentalia and Metatheria, but these may be the subject of a later article. I thank you all for watching and stay froggy.